All right. Good morning, everybody. We're uh, just waiting for a few more people to trickle in and connect to audio, and then we'll get started. So let's just hang tight for about a minute or two. All right, a little housekeeping. I see that we already have 80 people on, so this is great. So um, before we do some introductions, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping. I'm sure everybody's uh, maybe too familiar at this point with Zoom. So just, you know, some basics, microphone, if you don't want your video on, make sure you just give a look to the participant window, make sure you're uh, videos on or off as you choose. Um, be sure to use the chat. We have some uh, feedback that we're looking for in this um, session today. So just chat those, uh, you know, preferable chat all to everybody. But if you want to ask uh, in, in a more anonymous way, just, you know, shoot it to the panelists. And then if there's anything you agree with, feel free to use the reactions. If you're not sure about that, just a little happy face plus button on the bottom reactions. Um, it'll go away automatically, so you don't have to do that. But the hand feature, um, you know, that's a raise hand. So I'm sure you know all about that. So let's uh, let's get into it. So I'm Mark Costa. I'm the uh, board chair of LGSCC, and we have a, a great panel today. And Angie um, will be moderating um, the second uh, portion of the meeting. And so. Um, as uh, director of policy for the Energy Coalition, um, I'm, I've been really enthusiastic about uh, policy when it comes to uh, building performance standards. And so that's something that's been um, a pretty interesting development. So if we go to the next um, slide here, uh, what we have in the agenda today is um, each panelist will self-introduce themselves. They'll take about five or six minutes to uh, respond to a uh, prompt. And then we'll have a moderated Q&A and panel discussion. And then we'll have a, a quick rest break. Um, and then we'll get into some Q&A and a feedback session with an interactive tool on that. And so just to queue up where we're at, if we go to the next slide, um, you know, just to frame out what the building performance standards are. So they say BAPS. And sometimes people put an E in the middle, building energy performance standards or, uh, or building emissions performance standards. And it's really the next iteration of, uh, of policies that help us understand our built environment a little bit better. And it's a logical flow to move beyond benchmarking and really take on, um, take on information to the next step. So local governments have a really long history of leading by example and being the innovators and first adopters of some of the policies that make it to the statewide level. So this is really the next iteration. We have a handful of cities across the nation that Cliff will talk about. So as we think about climate action planning, accelerating our Z and E goals and electrification, um, you know, the BEPs are a really good next step after benchmarking, uh, whether it be at the local level or state level. So the DOE has a lot of tools. Uh, the White House supports this, which Cliff will talk about, and other cities have, have done this across the nation to varying degrees. So today, um, we'll hear from Cliff about um, who's really the nation's top expert on building performance standards. So it's really a, a treat to have Cliff here. And then we'll hear how local governments are leading um, the way and what, what's happening at the state level from Senator Becker. We'll hear about the local level from Barbara. And then we'll hear about some really interesting thoughts that will really challenge our understanding of where the market is headed with Lynn, who's doing some amazing work um, at the local level, state level, and international level, which is really interesting. So with that, we can get into the meat of the presentation today. I'll turn it over to Cliff, who's just in so many aspects been a thought leader, and I'll ask you to self-introduce yourself. But Cliff, it's really a pleasure to have you here today, and I'll turn it over to you to talk about what you've been doing um, in this space, which is really exciting. I've seen a lot of press about it. Um, so if you want to introduce yourself and just tell us what a building performance standard is, why they're needed, and you know what the best practices are around the state. 
Well, thank you very much, Mark. It's a real pleasure to be with all of you and uh, to be on this great panel. Um, and I will be talking about building performance standards uh, around the country and setting the table for the possibility of a statewide standard in uh, California. And um, to give you a little bit of background, uh, again, my name is Cliff Majerzyk. I'm with the Institute for Market Transformation, IMT. And um, I um, am a senior advisor here and have been um, with IMT since 2002. So working on this for a long time. And I've helped uh, write um, several of the building performance standards that have been adopted around the country and um, have uh, been uh, working with um, almost all of the jurisdictions that have adopted building performance standards to help them with implementation. So I'm gonna try and share my slide deck. Uh, let's see here. Hopefully this will work. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Can everyone see the slide? Looks good. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so, um, yep. So, IMT, um, our mission is to catalyze widespread and sustained uh, demand for high performing buildings. Uh, and we work by advancing policies and business practices that enable people to op build and operate healthy, high-performing buildings and to benefit everyone, regardless where they live, work, or play. So equity is a real important focus for us as well. So I'm going to talk about why building performance is important. Uh, I'll give you an introduction to building performance standards. Uh, and we refer to building performance standards as BEPS, even though we, there's no E in there. Usually when we use, uh, refer to it as, as Mark described, uh, BEPS just rolls off the tongue better. And BEPS is actually both singular and plural. So I'll talk about BEPS around the United States. So first, why I look at building performance? Well, buildings um, are where we spend more than 90% of our time. So they uh, disproportionately impact our health. Uh, and they are a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions, the number one sector nationally uh, when you account for electricity that they consume. Uh, and they waste energy. They waste a lot of energy. In fact, you can cost effectively cut buildings energy use by over 30% typically. Um, so that's our an intersection of, of many important priorities um, for our communities. Decarbonization, meeting our climate commitments, resilience, affordability, uh, public health, Buildings can um, contribute to all of these or uh, drag on all of them. Um, so why do we regulate existing buildings? Well, in 2040, uh, two thirds of the buildings that are standing today will still be standing. So it's critically important that we address them from a climate perspective because they're still going to be potentially uh, pumping out greenhouse gas emissions. And built building flurry is gonna double globally by 2040. Uh, now, we're not on pace to meet climate commitments currently. Um, in order to do that, buildings need to be an important part of the solution, and, and we need to make renovations to our buildings. But currently, only 2% of our commercial buildings are re renovated every year, uh, and less than 1% of residential buildings uh, undergo energy-saving renovations and decarbonizing renovations annually. So um, we really need to pick up the pace. And that's where building performance standards come in. But before I go into exactly what a building performance standard is, I'm going to um, put it in context. So this is an array of building performance policies. Building performance policies is obviously a broader topic, which includes uh, building performance standards. The most familiar building performance policy are building codes, building energy codes. Um, they have been around for many years. California was the first, actually, in the United States to adopt the kind of building energy code that is now more widely used around the world. Um, and they set standards for building design and construction, and they primarily apply to new construction and to major renovations. So they don't apply to every building every year, um, which is uh, where some of these other policies come in. Benchmarking and transparency laws um, are um, the next most widely used building performance policy. There are now more than 40 of them around the country, including, of course, several cities in California and uh, the state of California itself through AB 802. Uh, and they require that owners have to annually benchmark their buildings using the free federally provided Energy Star tool that provides a one to 100 score for all buildings. Uh, and then they have to publish that for the world to see. And that creates a virtuous cycle of competition for building owners to improve the performance of their buildings and attract and retain tenants, investors, and others. So uh, that can have a very positive effect. It has had a positive effect. It's just uh, hasn't put us on pace to meet up our climate commitments yet. 
Uh, audit requirements have been around for a little while. Uh, they require that building owners have to uh, audit their buildings, do an energy audit to see um, where they can find improvement to the building's performance. But then they don't actually, they're not actually required to make those improvements. It's just to, to look at it. And we have audit requirements in a variety of places around the country, including here in California, you have audit requirements in San Francisco, Los Angeles, and San Jose. Tune-up requirements um, uh, are a, a somewhat newer uh, approach, but quite similar to audit requirements in many ways. Rather than looking at capital improvements to the building, they look at uh, the opportunity to improve the existing systems without capital investments. So it's a, a tuning up the existing systems in the building, making low cost or no cost repairs and adjustments that can produce an excellent return on investment. All of those um, tools are important. And uh, another tool, which is particularly prevalent, prevalent in California is natural gas bans. Uh, and those are obviously very helpful in decarbonizing our buildings. Um, what they don't do typically is actually require that existing buildings that aren't pulling building permits, that aren't um, uh, you know, undergoing major change, that they have to get rid of their gas. And, and for some economic and sort of lifestyle reasons, it's, there's reason to think they can't really do a very good job on that. So gas bans can be an important part of, important tool in the toolkit, but we still need building performance standards to bring all of our buildings uh, up to uh, reach that decarbonization goal and to uh, achieve other priorities for our existing buildings. And, and so what building performance standards are is a requirement that buildings have to meet an a minimum threshold of performance. And that performance um, typically is talk talked about in energy or carbon, but it can be uh, performance across many layers, many different dimensions. So the building performance standards are the most powerful tool to improve the performance of existing buildings. Uh, they're requirements that are expressed in objective and numeric metrics. For instance, site energy use intensity, which could be, which is expressed typically in the United States as KBTU per year per square foot. Uh, but it could be anything, that, any metric that can be objectively uh, and numerically expressed. Uh, they apply to uh, buildings over a certain size, typically with certain exceptions, but largely applying to all buildings over a certain size. Uh, and they have date certain performance deadlines. So that means that every building, even if it's not pulling building permits, it's not being bought or sold, it's just doing the same thing it's always been doing, it still has to improve according to a date certain schedule. And so in this way, uh, they are different from and very much complementary to building codes. So what makes a BEPS difference? Well, they can require improvement across a wide, wide range of buildings. They can yield deep retrofits at scale across this wide range of buildings. They can drive private building owners to make private uh, investments in their own buildings to create value in those buildings and improve those buildings' performance. They provide a comprehensive, comprehensive approach to performance so they can uh, simultaneously address multiple dimensions of, of building performance and uh, enable a holistic approach to improving a building, uh, avoiding um, stovepipes. Uh, and uh, they can balance flexibility and immediate action and send a long-term signal to building owners, to the market. So folks know many years in advance where they're going to need to be and what exactly how the buildings are gonna to need to perform, not exactly what they need to do. That's up to each building owner to choose the technologies and practices that work best for them. But they will know where they're gonna to need to get. That sends a signal to the market to staff up, to, to uh, be able to provide the services needed to build, improve buildings. And it allows building owners to make changes at the time that work best for their buildings in terms of end of life of equipment, tenant turnover, refinancing mortgages, times when they can have the best impact at the lowest cost and least disrupt disruption. So there are eight existing building performance standards in the country. The first was in Washington, DC. The first in California is in Chula Vista. Uh, and you can see other big cities, including New York City have them. Um, and Washington State and Colorado are the two states that have building performance standards. And this is all since 2019. So uh, relatively new phenomena and growing very quickly. Um, and uh, what we see is that there's also uh, now a building performance standard coalition that President Biden announced in January. Uh, it has those uh, eight uh, cities and states as well as a total of 31 localities that are part of that, that are committed to adopting building performance standards um, and to acting by 2024. 
Uh, and IMT is assisting all of those jurisdictions as part of that coalition. And we invite all of you, if you would like to join the coalition, go to the uh, BP, National BPS Coalition dot uh, org, uh, or just send me an email. Um, and there's a mayoral uh, level commitment required to be part of that coalition. So there are a variety of approaches to uh, building performance standards. We're going to hear about um, the Chula Vista building performance standard. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about a recommended um, structure for a building performance standard, and that is the trajectory approach. It's an approach that um, I'll say a little bit more on in a moment with a graphic, but it's already been adopted in the most recently adopted building performance standard that's in Denver, uh, and it's in pending in Montgomery County. Uh, and it, uh, I think it strikes a lot of the balances and it, it benefits from the lessons learned from all of these eight building performance standards, uh, taking some of the, the best elements from them and learning from some of the challenges that they've run into and, and being responsive to stakeholders, including service providers and, and building owners. Uh, and it's contained in the IMT model building performance standard ordinance, which is on our website. You'll see the web address for that at the end of my uh, slides. And um, it's a free download um, and it's being used, I think, as a starting point for most jurisdictions as they look at adopting new building performance standards. It's just a starting point. Every jurisdiction has its own priorities, its own building stocks and stakeholder uh, interests, but it, it's a good place to start, especially in terms of structure. So here's what the trajectory approach looks like. Uh, in this, the vertical axis is building energy use, but it, it could be anything else. It could be on-site greenhouse gas emissions. It could be water use. There are a whole host of metrics that are amenable to be uh, applied to a building performance standard using the trajectory approach. The horizontal axis is time. Uh, on the left, you see the baseline year. That's perhaps the year that the ordinance, the building performance standard ordinance was adopted. On the right, you see the final standard compliance deadline. That's the year by which every building needs to achieve the same level of performance, every building of a particular type. In this example, let's say we're talking about office buildings, but it could be multifamily buildings or any other type of building. Each has its own final performance standard, each building type. Um, what you can see here is three lines. The top line is building A, uh, which uses the most energy to start off. Building B is the middle line. It uses a little bit less energy and building C is um, the bottom line, and that's the building that, that is using the least energy in the baseline year. So we recognize that, that buildings start in different places and that we want to equitably distribute the level of effort across all buildings, at the same time providing uh, clarity and, and long-term certainty. So that's what we do. The final performance standard is, is where you start in setting a trajectory approach. You decide what is reasonable to expect of each building type in terms, uh, say, of uh, KBTU per square foot per year, if you're talking about uh, EUI, for example. Uh, and then you draw a straight line from the building's baseline performance to that final performance. And where that line intersects at five-year intervals, that's what we recommend, five-year intervals to align with building uh, typical capital planning cycles for building owners, then that is where you set the interim target for each building. So each building has its unique um, interim standards. Uh, we would recommend that final performance standards be set you know, 2040 or later. So you'd actually, in that example, you'd have more than two sets of dots. You could have multiple interim periods, each with each building having its own interim standard in that period. Um, and buildings are required to improve on that rate. So you're asking the buildings that started using the most energy to improve at the fastest rate, but in each period, they are permitted to use more energy in each interim period. So in this way, we're trying to equitably um, distribute the level of effort across building owners while providing certainty and flexibility. So building performance standards uh, can be used to accomplish a variety of goals. Decarbonization and electrification are central among them. Um, grid reliability and flexibility, having buildings be an asset to the grid and, and play nice in terms of when they use energy and, and potentially even send back energy to the grid. Utility bill affordability, uh, inclusiveness and equity, very much aware of, of the need to avoid um, any displacements um, and to empower uh, residents um, uh, and address historic racism and, and other inequalities. Uh, and lastly, uh, resilience, public health and water. Water efficiency is very amenable to the trajectory approach for building performance standards. So with that, uh, I thank you. Uh, here is the address where you can see um, all the information that I've gone over. 
um, including uh, information about each jurisdiction around the country's building performance standards, uh, the model ordinance and other resources. So with that, um, I want to introduce uh, Josh Becker. Uh, he is a California state senator uh, from uh, a, a district that is principally composed of San Mateo County. Uh, and he's an old friend of mine. Josh and I are friends since freshman year of college. Um, we started a, a business together uh, and Josh um, has done really remarkable things uh, here in California uh, over the last many years. Uh, Josh is um, uh, the founder of the Full Circle Fund, um, which provides funding to innovative uh, nonprofits throughout the Bay Area um, to address uh, pressing local needs. Uh, and uh, Josh is, uh, has a lot of experience with clean energy as a um, entrepreneur and as a uh, venture capitalist who's invested in a number of leading uh, clean energy and energy efficiency startups. Um, and uh, Josh has um, been a leader. Uh, he's uh, the chair of the, a critical clean energy committee in the California State Senate. Uh, and uh, he's going to talk about what he's doing, how he's thinking about building performance standards, uh, and um, setting the table for a building performance standard ordinance that he's considering introducing. So with that, take it away, Josh. Well, thank you. It, it is very fun to uh, be here um, with Cliff, who's a good friend for many years. As was mentioned, everything I know about building performance standards, I've uh, learned from Cliff. Uh, I We scheduled this, by the way, it, after we scheduled this, they scheduled a, a transportation committee hearing. So I may have to be uh, back and forth uh, after this during the uh, rest of the program, but I really wanted to be here uh, today with you. Um, and like many of you got interested in, in this topic and in building performance standards, because we need a way to reduce greenhouse gas use in existing buildings. Um, as we, you know, as we as more or less detailed onsite emissions from buildings, they're about 10% of California's overall emissions, a little higher. And the whole luxury sector is around 15%. So emissions from buildings are a big deal. And when our cities look at their climate action plans and where the emissions are coming from locally, fossil gas, which we're make sure to use, not natural gas, fossil gas in buildings is often close to half of all the emissions of many of our cities that are trying to implement the climate action plans. And I represent uh, 24 cities uh, up and down Silicon Valley. Uh, in recent years, we've seen a lot of progress on new buildings. Actually, it's my hometown, Menlo Park. I'm on the board of Menlo Spark, which is a great nonprofit getting Met Menlo Park to uh, net zero. And, um, and we instituted the first all electric reach code for new buildings. And now many other cities have done it, including Oakland, San Jose, New York City. And that's great. So we've made a big step uh, towards um, new buildings. Um, and the latest building code update isn't going to get us all the way to all just to new electric, all new electric buildings, but it's a big step in that uh, direction too. But, you know, here's the problem. Not surprisingly, most of the fossil gas is used in our existing buildings. And uh, we have the best building codes. Um, and that's important, but we've also got to tackle emissions from more than 10 million um, existing buildings in California. Uh, and, you know, I know when Ithaca, New York was looking at de uh, electrifying their whole uh, community, uh, they have um, uh, estimate $500 million just for the city of Ithaca, New York to electrify all their existing uh, buildings. Um, and so we have to figure out how to tackle this. Um, and as, you know, my team looked at this and we learned more about building performance standards from Cliff, um, and IMT, uh, we said, um, this is a promising approach. And, you know, Cliff highlighted uh, many of the uh, benefits, um, but what I really like is it sets a performance target and provides owners time and flexibility to figure out how best to get to that target. It doesn't prescribe a particular solution, right? It sets a target, lets folks get to it and find the most innovative and cost-effective ways to get there. If we're going to set targets for improvements for buildings, I've also been thinking we should focus certainly on GHG emissions reductions, but also on water efficiency improvements. Um, you know, we have seen uh, the impacts of our current drought, and that's going to be more frequent. So be interested in audience feedback, whether they think that other metrics like a water efficiency standard or an indoor air quality standard 
should be included in BPS. But we should be thinking about uh, this in, within a larger context. You know, how do we improve comfort of buildings in the face of extreme temperature? How do we improve energy efficiency to save people money on energy bills? How do we make the indoor environment healthier in the face of rising cases of asthma from too much air pollution? How do we make our buildings more water efficient as climate change seems to be making our droughts longer and more severe? So we need to be investing in improvements in our buildings to make them serve our needs better in the changing environment of California right here. And to do that, we need a set of policies that can both provide carrots and sticks. We do need a stick like building performance standards to force change and motivate landlords to make investments even when they really don't want to do it. But we also need carrots, you know, ways to make it easier for people to do uh, what we need them to do. Um, you know, after all, we don't want a building performance standard to end up placing even greater financial burdens on low-income Californians who are already struggling to pay bills. And we don't want building upgrades to lead to rising rents and gentrification. So we need to be think thoughtful about this. And whatever policy we design, we need to be pairing the mandates, um, you know, these sticks with some carrots, things like rebates and access to low-cost financing, so that making these changes is more affordable. And as leaders, we need to make sure that we see the personal benefits of this investment. Better comfort, lower bills, cleaner air, and that's just not just the environmental benefits of reduced emissions and less water usage. So we're here in California, we're exploring the idea of a BPS. Uh, I know the CEC is interested in something like a building performance standard, building upon their benchmarking program uh, to really move the state forward towards reducing GHG emissions from buildings at the pace that's needed. Um, I considered introducing a bill to create a building performance standard this year, and we have a spot bill, but we needed more time to get the details right. So there's active engagement going on right now all across the state among community groups and environmental justice advocates trying to reach a consensus on the costs and benefits of building electrification, how a BPS could benefit that, what these groups' priorities are, et cetera. So I want my bill to be informed by and aligned with that effort. Uh, which is not expected to publish its, its findings till around this summer. In the meantime, I have a bill this year aimed at helping to enable tariffed on-bill financing, which allows electric utilities to make cost-effective investments in buildings and recoup those costs over many years through a charge on the bill that's less, that's less than the expected savings. That means building improvements and bill savings, even for people who don't have good credit and wouldn't have been able to borrow to make these investments. We're also looking at how this, to use state funding to enable law cost financing, including federal funding available from the Department of Energy to make projects cheaper and easier to finance. And of course, the governor proposed almost a billion dollars in this budget this year to support building upgrades, programs in low-income communities, and appliance rebates to support building electrification. These are good examples of the kind of carrots that we need to put in place so following through on any BPS mandates will be cheaper and easier for people to do. So I'm excited to be here this morning because I really wanna hear how all of you are thinking about the potential for building performance standards and other steps we can take to improve our building stock and address our climate goals. Looking forward to the rest of the conversation today. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> well, I appreciate that. And it's very refreshing to hear uh, that thought leadership at the, at the state level and that, um, you know, Cliff has really, you know, led the way here and, um, Folks are really in embracing it and also thinking about the equity lens on how to how to get this going and also how to complement it with existing legislation, existing programs at you know both state agencies, um, and and we'll see where it goes. And so it sounds like as we go into the main revise, we can have a good one-two combo in terms of what we're doing here. We see a couple questions in the chat. We'll we'll get to that in a second, but before we do. Um, I want to introduce uh, Barbara, and Barbara, you can uh, actually self-introduce. But um, you know, if you can share why uh, you took action at the local level, and as um, you know, many people in the state, as Cliff mentioned, San Jose, San Francisco, uh, we have Brisbane, we have Chula Vista, Los Angeles. Um, we've all gone through this, but hindsight's always twenty twenty. So if you can share a little bit uh, what you wish you knew um, when you started this process, it would be helpful for um, all the other local governments on the call. So yes. take it away. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Barbara Lucci. I work for the city of Chula Vista. I've been working for the city for over seven years. 
um, on uh, mostly commercial building programs. Uh, I worked with businesses for a long time and uh, we um, decided to develop this ordinance based on our experience working uh, with businesses. Um, we uh, used to help businesses uh, conserve and save energy uh, with the Freebie program, which uh, was a program designed uh, to, in fact, visit businesses, conduct a small audit, uh, and help them improve their consumption. Uh, but unfortunately, with many of these businesses, we used to hear, you know, we just lease the space, we don't have control over the building, uh, because the owner does. And so the building performance ordinance came about because of this, and because other cities were doing it already, um, it was very important for us to make that step. So it took about two years to develop it. Uh, thankfully, we had a contractor that was financed by the utility and uh, we were able to develop this ordinance looking at other cities, um, at New York and uh, Denver, and then of course in California, San Francisco and San Diego as well, and Berkeley. And uh, they're still being super helpful uh, with us uh, for during this transition and uh, with the, the implementation of the ordinance. Uh, so our ordinance requires that buildings 20,000 square feet and above um, report to us their energy consumption through Energy Star Portfolio Manager. And uh, after five years, if the building is not performing, um, we look at both energy score as well as energy use intensity in the building. Um, we, re we will require that they go through a ASHRAE Level 1 audit. And uh, once that is done, um, then they will have to act upon that audit. And uh, of course, everything has to be cost effective, uh, but then they have another five years to actually implement those fundings. Um, lessons learned so far. <laughs> We were developing this ordinance during uh, COVID in 2020, and it was approved in March of 2021 by council. Um, so mostly, um, as of right now, we have had a very good experience. Uh, like I said, we have been, uh, other cities have been super helpful um, in giving us, you know, advice based on their own experience. Uh, but I think the hardest part is reaching out to these building owners, or owners because some of them are not in Chula Vista or they're even out of state. Um, so marketing the ordinance, I think is crucial. Um, and as well, marketing it in a way uh, that entices them to be interested and to want to save energy and to see the benefits of it, um, even on their own building um, and their uh, building value as well. So for us, uh, you know, marketing it to those uh, building owners of, you know, the, those 20,000 square feet buildings that have never benchmarked before is a challenge. So uh, we're being very patient, helpful, um, and kind of like holding their hand through it. And so uh, I'm having fun with it. It's challenging and I like it. So All right. Well, thanks, Barbara. It's a really, really good insight. And it's, yes, very helpful to uh, learn from from others that have been uh, been there before. So and it's a great community. And one one thing that Cliff uh, may talk about later is, um, you know, the the initiative that they rolled out in conjunction with the White House support. So that's really interesting that there's a cohort and the mayoral support is really, really helpful. And it's a good model they've used in the past. Um, so with that, I think we're going to transition to our last speaker before we hand it over to Angie. But it's it's a real pleasure to, to have Lynn on. Um, if, if you haven't heard of her, um, Lynn, I'm sure you're going to introduce yourself. But um, really interesting. I'm always a big fan of uh, economics is just having a little bit of background in that. 
and your your insights to uh, what this means for for the larger market is always uh, a really interesting thing. So, um, you know, if if you can talk a little bit about uh, your background and then describe the relationship between a BEPS program and the future of our energy supply and customer and possible market structures for energy and carbon. Now, however you want to tackle that, uh, please go for it. Great, thanks, Mark, and thank you for inviting me. Uh, I will kind of start big picture and then try to connect into the building uh, performance standards question. Um, so uh, I am a, I'm an economist, as Mark said, I direct a center called the Institute for Regulatory Law and Economics uh, at the University of Colorado, Denver. And I also uh, have a, a long time uh, collaborative research project with uh, my, my longtime co-author, David Chasson, who's a um, st senior staff scientist at Slack National Laboratory at Stanford. And we work in an area that's called transactive energy. And the idea is to you know, think about the existing distribution system. You know, we have a wires network, we have meters, we have all of our devices inside of, of buildings that connect uh, to our meters and some are energy consuming. And increasingly, uh, those of us who are at the end that used to just be, I flip the switch and the light goes on type of uh, consumers, we now have a lot more heterogeneity and diversity of capabilities of our energy devices with electric vehicles, uh, with digitization and automation that allow us to better control uh, our um, energy consumption. So we are both producers and consumers and we can be both at very low transaction costs because of digital automation. And so the area that um, that we work on is called transactive energy, and uh, which which we were were part of the kind of foundational projects in that back in the mid two thousands, and the idea with transactive energy is um, you know think the easiest way to think of it is with thermostat. So think about the thermostat in your home, and imagine that it's a, a digital thermostat and it is a capable of two way uh, communication. Uh, so an Ecobee is a great example of, of the, kind of, the kind of distribution edge user device that uh, has the capabilities um, that I'm thinking about. So you have Ecobee thermostat in your home and you and everyone else that's in this, in this meeting, we are all connected on a digital platform that is a local energy market. And that we, rather than paying just a fixed average rate all, all the time of year, which gives us zero incentive to actually control and manage our energy use um, beyond just wanting to manage the size of the bill. Um, it doesn't give us any incentive to manage our energy use as the either the economic or the environmental cost of our energy consumption fluctuates over the course of the day, the season, the year. So if our thermostats are all connected in this local energy market and you program your thermostat with your willingness to pay, right? And um, there are very user-friendly ways to do this so that you can um, basically say, I want more econ economy or I want more comfort. Um, there are also nerdier ways to do that by using things like the, um, uh, the service, if this, then that, which you can use Boolean logic to say, if the price, the real-time price goes above, say nine cents a kilowatt hour, then change the temperature setting on my air conditioner. And because of the beauty of thermal mass in buildings, it will take a while for your building to get so warm as to give you discomfort. And that's the idea of transactive energy is to use the informative nature of price signals to coordinate supply and demand in the, the distribution system. And uh, we are currently working, uh, just started working on a, um, a five year long project called Transactive Energy Service System 2.0. Uh, 1.0 was in uh, Holy, with Holy Cross Energy in Colorado. Um, but this is funded through the new Department of Energy Connected Communities Grid Efficient Buildings uh, Initiative. And we'll be working with New Hampshire Electric Co 
cooperative and efficiency main to enable the the interconnection and the transactive participation of battery storage in that coordination. Um, and again, it's it's easy and, and convenient for the end user because of the automation. So, so that is, is both, you know, it's a, a technical capability that merges the engineering and the economics and really harnesses the benefits of digitalization and automation. Um, I will just say briefly at the, at the state level, um, the center I direct, uh, the Institute for Regulatory Law and Economics, uh, we have since 2004 uh, per, um, directed an annual workshop for public utility commissioners and staff where we gather a, a small Socratic seminar, uh, gather them together around a table with some foundational law and economics readings and, uh, and have some very deep conversations to uh, uh, ground them in foundational principles to hopefully enable better regulatory decision making in the face of dynamic technological change. And uh, boy, do we have a lot of dynamic technological change at the moment. Uh, and then finally, the uh, Mark mentioned international. Uh, he and I participate in uh, an international energy agency initiative that's called the Global Observatory on Peer-to-Peer -peer Community Provided and Transactive Energy Systems. And we have, you know, there's five subtasks, one having to do with power systems, one having to do with the data and computing and so on. Uh, and I direct the transactions and markets subtask. So there's a lot of really uh, important initiatives in local energy markets and peer-to-peer -peer and transactive systems. There's a lot of work being done in Europe and a lot of lessons that we could learn from uh, better interaction and learning some of their best practices. Um, and then the, the final comment that I would make to connect directly to building performance standards is that because of the dynamics of technological change and innovation, I would definitely caution that those performance standards should be focused on performance, right? That word performance needs to do a lot of the work here and to be technology neutral so as not to provide barriers to the kinds of innovation that we are currently seeing that can give us the low carbon future that we're all striving for. All right, extremely interesting, uh, Lynn, thanks for that. And way to connect it back to the BEP standards and, and really making this, as Senator Becker pointed out, you know, very much worthwhile for building owners, right? So the carrots and the sticks and some of those carrots um, really necessitate you know, rethinking of our energy system and how we interact with our buildings and, and how we're all connected, right? And, you know, there's some economic principles around connectedness and value of, of networks. The more that you're connected, the more value there is. And it exponentially grow, grows as you are connected. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Angie to walk us through the next step of our, um, of our session today. But I just really want to thank everybody for giving that groundwork. And we'll keep moving in the agenda today. Thanks, Mark. Good morning, everybody. Thanks again to our esteemed panel. That was fantastic. A really nice foundation for us to now continue our conversation. This portion of the conversation is going to be more interactive. So um, I'll have uh, about 15 minutes to do some moderated questions. Then we're going to take a tiny break. We'll come back. And what I really would like you guys to do is to add more questions to the chat. So just imagine, I know a lot of you are in local government consider what you know if there's going to be a statewide policy or you're developing a local policy what that would be like for you what questions might you have for these experts that we have for you here today um so let's go ahead i'm so i'm angie hacker statewide best practices for seek and let's start by talking about best practices and some of you have already started um so we talk about best practices in building performance standards at different levels of government. And then listening to you all, I can see there are lots of different options, levers and approaches, different metrics you can pick, property types, sectors, phasing, data management, how to tie it together with other building standards, how to make it easier for property owners, all sorts of levers and decisions to be made. I just wonder if you could share from your perspective what approaches you like, what have you seen to be effective and why? And um, why don't I start here with Cliff, because you started off talking a little bit already about this, but tell us more about some of the approaches around the country. Thank you, Angie, and thanks for um, uh, the other panelists for the great presentations. Um, so in terms of pre uh, approaches, 
Um, there is no precedent yet other than Colorado of a jurisdiction where both a locality and the state have adopted building performance standards. Um, it, of course, here in California, you have Chula Vista, which has adopted a, a building performance standard, but the state hasn't yet done so. Um, and so I would say that, and Colorado is, is sort of a work in progress. The, the state has a lot of rulemaking to do on their building performance standard, but they have established that they will not preempt the Denver building performance standard. And I think that's a best practice. What, what I think that actually provides the best model for California is California, the way California has handled benchmarking and transparency laws. So here uh, in the same, similar to building performance standards, the first were adopted by localities, by localities like San Francisco and Berkeley that were the first to adopt benchmarking and transparency laws. Uh, other localities followed, um, then the, the state adopted its own uh, benchmarking and transparency law, AB 802. And what it did when it uh, adopted that law is it said, okay, any uh, building owner who complies with a local building uh, benchmarking and transparency law will be in compliance with the state law as long as the, the local law meets certain requirements. And, and CEC administers this for the state and it certifies, and it has certified every one of the existing building performance standards, sorry, existing benchmarking laws. So uh, it, it minimizes the paperwork. It recognizes that the localities have the best relationship with their building owners. They already have building departments that are providing building permits. They already have um, property taxes that the building uh, owners are paying directly to them. So they have relationships there. They can enforce these requirements. Um, and the, the state should step out of the way for those localities that, that want to lead and just support them. Uh, and then the localities can provide the data to the state and the state can provide some IT infrastructure and, and some rulemaking support and that sort of thing. Um, but then the state acts as the backstop for if a locality doesn't want to adopt its own benchmarking law or in the example of building performance standards, if a locality doesn't adopt a building performance standard, then the state would, um, would enforce the statewide building performance standard. So I would say that that's a great model for the way California could do to sort of follow the benchmarking model. And, and obviously there's some room for improvement on benchmarking, but I think that's more around resources and other things. And the other thing I would just say is that the benchmarking law itself provides California a great head start for a building performance standard because the data that is collected from the benchmarking laws from AB 802 and the local benchmarking laws is critically important to setting final performance standards uh, and, and being able to move forward with building performance. So I'm gonna let anybody else who'd like to respond to that question or to post comments, go ahead and chime in. You know, Barbara, I wonder if, if you would mind sharing a little bit more about your experience in Chula Vista and just what kinds of decisions you had to make, all the different options in front of you and you and you chose a path. Can you tell us a little bit about what you were considering and, and why you chose the path you did? Yes. Um, so the city of Chula Vista is a smaller city uh, in the sense that we don't have large buildings or skyscrapers and thousands and thousands of square feet. Um, so our idea was to cover as many commercial and multifamily buildings as possible. And so that is why we lowered the, the square footage threshold. Uh, so that was very important for us and, uh, and, and it was crucial. And because we knew these buildings from just walking into them multiple times uh, by visiting businesses, we also knew that a lot of the smaller commercial buildings were old um, and needed improvements. Uh, and so that is why we considered the performance improvements, um, specifically because we knew that a lot of these buildings needed uh, um, help. Um, and, um, and, and we know that it will help. Uh, so, uh, Yes, that was our experience. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, you know, and talking about this, um, the, the connection between local and statewide policies, where they may exist and where they may overlap. What, what challenges do we see now that more local governments, maybe in California, are starting to develop their own building performance standards? What challenges might you foresee um, if there was a state so state legislation for building performance standards and also a local uh, building performance standards. Um, so I wonder, maybe I can start with Senator Becker, if you wouldn't mind addressing that question, if that's come up for you already. 
Well, I think for the most part, you know, people are concerned about the cost, potential costs and making sure that those don't fall on the backs of lower income uh, residents. And they, you know, worry about our housing challenges and is, you know, is this somehow going to make it worse? And that's why, as I discussed, we need to get the financial incentives right and focus on to make low cost financing available uh, for one thing. Um, and, um, you know, I'm confident, and that's why it's important to get more and more examples, both at the city level and at, at, uh, you know, at the state lo level to show that this can be done. Um, you know, personally, I, I believe and I'm confident that the technology is there. We have the technology to uh, make these improvements um, and we can make them cost effectively. Um, but, you know, not everybody, you know, is quite aware of that, right? So we have need a process to bring everyone along. Um, we also need to think about how a state level building performance standard inter does interact with standards already set at the local level. Um, and I think this could work like our building codes and our reach codes uh, where the state could require a minimum standard, but cities and counties have the ability to, uh, you know, go beyond that. Um, the state, you know, could also provide centralized support to make it easier for local implementation of these standards, and I'm hopeful that will happen. And it's great that there's support, I think, at the at the Energy Commission. But things like databases and tools for gathering and analyzing data um, will be helpful, especially for smaller cities that might struggle to design a BPS on their own. We have to be sensitive to that. So those are some thoughts. I'll just add, you know. I think Josh made some great points and those resources are, are critically important. And also it's important to recognize that many building owners own buildings in multiple localities throughout the state. And so some level of harmonization, and that's where a, a state uh, law could really be helpful, um, can help building owners so that they don't feel like they have to learn completely new laws for five different jurisdictions in which they own buildings, for instance. And we've heard that strongly from uh, building owners, which is one of the reasons why they've been fairly supportive of our, our model ordinance as a way to drive standardization. Another important piece of standardization is that Chula Vista and all the jurisdictions rely on the Energy Star Portfolio Manager tool, which is something that's very familiar already to most building owners. And Lynn, I, I know you've done research internationally on this topic. I wonder if you want to chime in on what you're seeing. I was just going to add there that I, I think there are a couple, well, there's you know, two, the two sort of foundational rules in economics, rule one is people respond to incentives. And rule two is there are no solutions, there are only trade-offs. And so, so you know, the, this kind of harmonization, standardization at the state and local level is, it, it illustrates the challenge of the trade-offs associated here, because especially in a state like California, where there's so much, um, you know, so much climate and weather variation just within the state. And so a rule that works well for a coastal community may not work well for a mountain community or a desert community. And so, um, you know, there, there are definitely some trade-offs there that, that I suspect the you know, building owners are, are very aware of, especially those that own in multiple locations. Um, and these, these issues definitely come up internationally as well uh, with the, the um, you know, kind of local, local versus, in, in the case of European countries, local versus country versus EU uh, questions of, of harmonization and the costs, the, co the, the costs associated with the harmonization uh, in addition to the benefits. So uh, no, no easy answers coming from The Economist, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, we do have a chance. Um, so once we're done with Q&A, and again, please do be throwing those in the chat, uh, we're, gonna get, we're gonna have a feedback session where we get to talk more about state legislation, the potential for state legislation. So um, we've got time to have those thoughts there and you guys get to share your, uh, your thoughts and ideas. Um, I wonder if we can move now to talk a little bit about how do, we, how do we talk about this within our communities? How can we talk about the benefits of investing in buildings in this way and, you know, through the building performance standard approach? Um, and Barbara, you've had a lot of experience doing this, trying to talk um, with folks in Chula Vista and making sure they understand the benefits. Tell us a little bit more about how you shared that message. Yes. Um... Whenever, so we're receiving a lot of 
calls and people asking uh, about the ordinance uh, and some people actually question it or why is it important to do this um, and so we explain you know our climate action plan and what it means and uh, what uh, the city's goals are and uh, how important it is for the building stock to be um, more energy efficient, especially when you have buildings that uh, were built in the 60s or 70s. Um, and they, you know, people are so uh, embedded in their day-to-day -day life and their work. They don't think about insulation or windows or uh, what's going on on the roof with those units, you know, uh, for air conditioning and heating. Um, and so, and some of them have not maintained them until, you know, they, they just go dead. Um, so, we try to educate them and we have been trying to do this for a long time and just to explain to them how important how important it is building maintenance and just tackling you know first of all the lighting uh the little things initially um, occupant behavior um all the way up to the roof obviously um and of course we also explain that um you know, cost effectiveness is important. Uh, we are hoping to be able to offer incentives eventually um, through the utility. Um, so um, we will see about that, but that would be amazing if we're able to help those uh, uh, buildings, especially in the low income areas in our city, um, those multifamily buildings, because we don't want the renters to have to deal with uh, you know, with those costs, so. I'm sure all the folks, all of our audience is um, thinking about how they would probably try to talk about this with their community and what, what challenges they may face. I wonder if anybody else wants to respond to that question. I, yeah, I would just add that, you know, our, our buildings, after our people, our buildings are our community's most valuable asset. Um, and we have the opportunity to really improve the value of that asset and in so doing create jobs, jobs at all skill levels, from uh, roofers and plumbers to electricians to engineers and architects. And um, those jobs have to be done on site. They can't be offshore. So it creates a huge opportunity and we need to make sure that those jobs um, are equitably distributed. Uh, and workforce training is reaching folks who uh, are in um, disinvested communities, that um, the procurement is done in such a way that business owners from those disinvested communities and, and folks who've sub been subject to historic systemic racism have an, uh, a real opportunity. And there's a lot of unintended ways that contracts get delivered that, that aren't conducive to equity. So there's terrific opportunities, I think, for a building performance standard to make our buildings better, make us comfortable, more comfortable and healthy, addressing things like indoor air quality potentially, uh, while um, driving economic development and driving equitable development and, and protecting against displacement. And, and the kinds of things that Josh talked about before, uh, ec uh, access to capital, especially for buildings that are serving disinvested communities, both uh, in terms of loans and, and potentially also grants is, is gonna be critically important. And there's gonna be a great return on investment especially to the extent that we target reducing coincident peak demand so that we don't have to invest billions of dollars on the supply side of the grid because the buildings can do that much more cost effectively. Thank you. You know, I think if you go to IMT's website, there's gonna be all sorts of resources for you probably, including lots of talking points and, and various um, things for you to use at the local level. That's our time for the moderated uh, question portion. So we're Can I just say one last thing, Angie, just, you know, yeah. there's so much talk about extreme heat right now and, and indoor air quality. So those are two things to really, I think we can focus on. There's a lot of interest up here around heat pumps and how they can be helpful in efficiency while also providing much needed cooling. So there's, you know, some momentum in some of those areas as well. Thank you. And Senator Becker, just want to take a moment to say thank you for the work you're doing at the state level. And also, I have fossil gas now in my back pocket. So thanks for that term. All right, you guys, we're going to take a little five minute break here and we're going to be right back to address your questions with our panel. So take a moment, stretch, um, get some coffee, and we'll see you back at 10.05. Thanks for being here.
All right, everybody. We're coming on back. I'm going to ask my panelists to go ahead and go back on camera when you're ready. All right. So um, we're back for questions. And you guys had a lot. And I feel like we could be here for three hours. So we're not going to get through all of them. Or we're going to do our best to pluck out a few here. And then you'll have more time in the next um, portion of the event for the feedback session to share more thoughts. Um, let's go ahead and start. This isn't going in any particular order. Um, but Ron Allen from Sacramento County asked Senator Becker if he's still here. I wonder if he's here, or maybe he had to go to his committee meeting. Uh, but others can maybe address it too. What's the best approach in implementing an energy benchmarking policy, voluntary or mandatory with penalties? Who would be best to develop mandatory energy benchmarking policies, statewide, countywide, or citywide? So maybe Senator Becker's not here, but would anybody else like to try to tackle that one? Well, I mean, California already has mandatory statewide benchmarking. Um, that, uh, you know, that was AB802 that, that California passed several years ago. Um, I think voluntary benchmarking is, is great. And, and we've worked with a number of jurisdictions to put in place voluntary benchmarking, but participation rates typically aren't all that high. And the, the buildings that use the most energy that could most benefit from, from benchmarking are often least likely to participate in voluntary. So um, that's why states, around, states and cities around the country have adopted um, benchmarking and transparencies like 802. Uh, and there's um, well over 12 billion um, square feet of space nationally in, in places like New York City, Washington DC, Chicago, Austin, Salt Lake City, Reno, all of these jurisdictions have benchmarking and transparency laws. The recognition that you know, the market can't manage when it doesn't measure and so the market needs information about building performance. And by the way, the SEC just released rules, not benchmarking rules, but it's very much validating the concept of their proposed rules that they announced yesterday that greenhouse gas emissions are financially material and need to be um, disclosed to the market. Okay, well, you know, it looks like some folks are, um, they're thinking about their bucket of options, um, all the different paths they could take, maybe building performance standard, maybe something else. And so Laura Toller asks, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on, about efforts tangential to BPF, such as building electrification, which is distinctly not technology neutral. How can or should municipalities allow for innovation while going down the path of building electrification and decarbonization? I would say that the goal you can accomplish uh, a, and I agree with Lynn completely, you want technology neutral policies, policies that, that push performance without specifying technology. And, and that's what we're talking about in, um, with something like a decarbonization policy, using the trajectory approach to require that buildings over time go to zero on-site greenhouse gas emissions. And that can be accomplished through electrification. It's probably going to have to be, eventually it's going to have to be part of that solution, um, but uh, in the interim, uh, during to get uh, interim standards, just improving efficiency um, in many cases without electrification can can uh, help a building to um, comply for a, a limited period of time, uh, and potentially that could you know get the building to the point where, say, its existing furnace or boiler reaches end of life, uh, and it, it's much more cost effective to look at electrifying it at those points in a building's life cycle. Yeah, and I'll just add, just in the in the context of the the framing of the, the question that you know, building electrification is it in and of itself as a goal is not technology neutral, right? It's saying we should move from other energy using technologies in buildings to electrification in buildings, and um, I think that's you know, given our existing technologies, that's true. But and, and but focusing as as Cliff just said, focusing the the framing of the performance as the greenhouse gas emissions, and you know that you know currently electrification is the technology that we know satisfies that. There may be others in the future that we that we haven't learned, we haven't created yet. And and so I think that's the you know not raising a barrier, you know having having standards defined in a way that doesn't raise barriers to other technologies uh, is essential. I have a couple of questions here for, um, for Barbara. So Barbara, uh, Celine Lawrence 
from the city of Irvine is asking, does Chula Vista also have an all electric ordinance for new construction or is this the only policy mechanism to address building decarbonization? Thanks. <laughs> yes, uh, for now we just have this ordinance and also a residential ordinance that um, um, requires basically homes that uh, pull specific permits to also go through energy improvements um, and, uh, you know, low hanging fruit, uh, such as uh, changing light bulbs and things like that. Uh, but we are uh, looking into electrification as well. We're paying attention. You know, I'm wondering if anybody on the panel has seen, you know, has somebody had a local ordinance uh, building code that uh, addressed energy and then added this on top, added, at a later date, added a, a kicker of a building performance standard on top? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. So, of course, every jurisdiction, the eight jurisdictions that have building performance standards all had uh, energy codes before yes. that. Um, and they all benefited either from local or statewide benchmarking and transparency laws before they, well, no, I should say, in the case of Colorado, they adopted simultaneously a benchmarking law and a building performance standard. Um, did, did that answer your question? I'm not sure if I understand. I mean, I guess I did a reach code or electrification code, and then at a later date, decided to add metrics and other requirements on top, sort of beefing it up. Yes, um, Boston, for instance, already had a reach code before they adopted their building performance standard. Washington, D.C. had a strong energy code amendments um, strengthening the IECC and, and ASHRAE 90.1 before they adopted their building performance standard. New York City has um, strong um, uh, energy code. So in general, I think most jurisdictions have chosen to go first with building codes and to really strengthen their building codes and put in place reach codes, which makes a lot of sense. The last thing you want is for a building to be built in compliance with the code and then have tr trouble very soon after complying with the BEPS. So we recommend that codes and building performance standards be uh, adopted in parallel, or it's great if you want to do your code first and follow with the building performance standard. All right, um, this other question we'll tackle for Barbara also. Um, Andrew, if you have one or two from me, then I, I need to go. Oh. Yeah, you know, I'm trying to see if there's any. Also, I saw that Dan Cobb uh, had a question about model ordinances for cities. I don't know if somebody. Do you want to tackle that one? No, I, that, I thought that was a good question. I don't have an answer to that one. <laughs> well, let's see. There was a question here. How? Uh, let's see. For all panelists, this is from Brittany Moffitt. Are you fielding questions from residents and other stakeholders about resilience implications for electrification? Would you share your experience and approach in meeting concerns and leveraging the opportunities that come with electrification? Well, if it's resilient, you know, grid resilience, um, and, and certainly, um, you know, the CC's projections for the electricity grid do assume. <clears throat> um, they've done that planning with the extra load in mind for electrification as we electrify um, both our both transportation and buildings. Um, so that is being taken into account in these projections. And um, in terms of, you know, when people talk about resilient communities, I and mean, again, I think that's where heat pumps and some of these technologies come into play for the reasons we discussed earlier. Yeah. Angie, if I could add to that, because there are a couple of different questions that have come up in the chat regarding resilience and the implications of electrification. And you know, as I, you know, I'm not a California resident, so I just see this from afar. But certainly, the 2020 experience that you all had, um, you know, you you have firsthand experience of some of the resilience challenges uh, on the grid, and one of the one of the reasons why we do the transactive energy research that we do is precisely to enable um, devices around the edge of the network and you know, the buildings in which many of those devices live or if they're electric vehicles, the, the buildings in which they plug in, enabling those buildings to be flexible and adaptable. And I think those, those are the things that I would, I would encourage people to think about as they're looking at the resilience questions is what are the capabilities of these different resources 
to be flexible, both on the supply side and on the demand side, because the more flexibility you have, the better coordination you have between physical coordination between supply and demand. Um, and that's why we focus on transactive energy, because then we use the fact that prices are very, very informative as a way to coordinate um, even down to, to fairly small timescales. And that really does help with the resilience challenge I would argue more than than kind of a regulatory, you know, an EV, you know, a, a, an EV charging rate that you might have in the tariff. And Angie, if, if you don't mind, just a friendly amendment to that question um, before uh, folks go is that, um, you know, as on the resilience question, you know, as we electrify our building stock, the metrics around performance for buildings do do change, right? As we kind of get rid of natural gas and electrify, so. You know, what role do DERs play in resilience and benefiting the distribution network on, on the grid for resilience? And, and how does that help us get better performing buildings and, and reduce GHGs? What role do DERs play in that role? So either Cliff uh, or, or Lynn there. Um, that's a great question, Mark. Thank you. Uh, DERs are obviously... Uh, Play a critically important role in resilience. Um, you know, we're talking about storage, on-site generation, um, microgrids uh, in the event of blackouts or brownouts. All of those can play really critical roles. They're beneficial both directly to the building owner and they can be beneficial to the whole grid. Uh, and so there are some potential externalities there, positive externalities, and, and um, tariff pricing and, and utility incentives and other things need to reward building owners to the extent that they're taking using DERs to provide um, reliability to the grid. Uh, and that is typically gonna be a lower cost solution than just building new transmission lines and uh, new distribution infrastructure, new substations. All of those things are probably gonna be needed um, as we go to the decarbonize our grid, but we can save billions and billions of dollars by rewarding building owners for doing the right thing, especially through DERs and through load shifting, through design of building and, and other passive measures. And I would just add to that that I mean, we, we also do see, though, that DERs can have a destabilizing effect in, in the grid. You know, we've, you've all seen the, the infamous duck curve diagrams and how much ramping of, of non-DERs has to happen at, you know, six at night when the solar panels all kick off. And, um, you know, so getting that more granular, more automated, price-based coordination in the system would, I think, you know, reduce the duck curve problem. Uh, and for that reason, I think there's not, you know, the, the complement to the DER is in terms of the flexibility and adaptability is the digital system. And I think digitalization is the underappreciated clean tech in, in the system. Thanks for that, Mark. Um, we're gonna get through a couple more questions here. I think, um, yeah, the folks are kind of really thinking about how they would do this in-house at a city or county level. So Rebecca Baptiste says, what have you found are best practices in addressing data quality issues? In San Diego, we've seen some issues with under-reporting of energy data due to, the, due to net metered solar or only reporting common area data instead of whole building data. Are other jurisdictions with BPS requiring third-party data verification to ensure all energy data is being reported and counted towards BPS threshold for actions? Uh, yeah, there are jurisdictions that do require third party verification, um, Chicago, Montgomery County, um, a couple others. Uh, there is, data quality is, is a hugely important issue, you know, garbage in, garbage out, and we want good data to inform um, the development of good policy, and we want the market to have good data so that building owners with high performing buildings are rewarded by the market. Uh, and the SEC is now stepping in on that. They're, they're now going to require auditing for large companies, uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, disclosures uh, and for their uh, delivery on their own uh, commitments, their own environmental commitments um, per their pr proposed rule yesterday. So jurisdictions are also, you don't, and they can do the data quality assurance themselves in-house or, or outsourcing it. So there are a lot of, a lot of tools, but all of them, uh, you know, data quality is, has to be the solid foundation on which all policy is built. And utilities also play a really important role here. Utilities should be doing their own data quality assurance on their own metered data and, and uploading that data directly to portfolio manager for further sharing to the jurisdictions. 
Uh, and utilities can be a resource around debt equality insurance directly to building owners and to jurisdictions. So there's a lot to be done there and it's kind of unsexy, but it's really critically important. Barbara, I wondered if you could share a little bit about your experience with data management and, and maybe your experience working with um, the utilities on that kind of data. What, what has it been like? Um, so far, we don't have uh, much experience because we're uh, just beginning implementation this year, uh, but we do have experience with our own buildings. Uh, um, so yes, data quality is very important. Um, we struggle with it sometimes. Uh, um, there may be errors, you know, with uploads into Energy Star Portfolio Manager. Um, uh, one good thing is that um, you know, the person who's in charge at the city of uh, reporting uh, for our own buildings, um, we're in strict contact with each other. And so I can hear all uh, her struggles. And uh, of course, you know, when I also have to deal with it, with building owners that call me, um, I understand where they're coming from. And uh, you know, very often we have already been through the same issue and so we're able to help them and direct them, you know, towards the utility or um, however that problem needs to be resolved. All right, thank you. And I see a lot of questions being answered in the chat. So thanks you guys for doing that as we go along here. Um, one more question here, this is from Garrett Wong, Santa Barbara County. How can a resource constrained community establish and sustain a program from a staffing and resources perspective? Yeah, we do work with a lot of resource constrained communities. Um, and um, so there's a lot I can say on that. First off, you know, the state has resources and the state can provide, take advantage of economies of scale by providing IT infrastructure rules that a city can opt into a whole, there's a whole panoply of things that a state can do that can make it easier for a locality to adopt, a building, adopt and implement a building performance standard. And in fact, the state could even, and I would love to see the state provide direct financial assistance to those jurisdictions that choose to uh, adopt and implement building performance standards following Chula Vista's lead. Um, beyond that, I can say, you know, building performance standard is not, uh, a small thing, it does take some real resources. Um, you know, a, a jurisdiction is probably gonna need to devote, you know, more than a full FTE to uh, adopting and, and implementing a building performance standard, especially during the startup phase. Um, there are some economies that you can get from taking advantage of, of things like the IMT model building performance standard ordinance so that you, you have a real starting point, but even with that resources are required. And I would say for a jurisdiction that has, that's really tight on resources, it may be that a building performance standard isn't the right policy. If you don't have enough resources to do it right, probably best not to do it at all. You could put those resources into things like improved building energy code enforcement and compliance, because every jurisdiction already has building energy codes and most jurisdictions have a problem with not enough building owners complying. Often just because it's too much of a hassle or they don't really know or fully understand the requirements. A lot of building departments view their own building energy codes as not a life safety code, which I would argue with that characterization, and so not a priority. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, the lowest hanging fruit is sometimes there. There's other great low hanging fruit. Benchmarking and transparency laws are a good place to start. They set the table for a building performance standard and they take less, less resources. Angie, I think you're muted. Hi, sorry about that. Thanks, Cliff. Um, so Mark has a blended question. I think he's taken some of our questions and summarized them for me. How do BPS metrics change as we electrify our building stock? So maybe Lynn, can you help us with that one? I'm not sure I can. <laughs> <laughs> or anybody would like to take a crack. Sorry, would you repeat the question? How do building performance standards uh, metrics change as we electrify our building stock? Well, Cliff, maybe it would also be helpful to talk about how you tailor the metrics for that performance target, right? It's just not a one size fits all metric. We need this KBTU per square foot. You, you do some diligence in that, right? Right, absolutely. That's, that's one of the, the more demanding parts of, of uh, using a trajectory approach is you do need to do a real analysis for each building type, you know, for offices, say, for retail, for hotels, for multifamily. What is a um, ambitious but achievable final performance standard 
uh, for each metric. So um, you may have site EUI as a performance metric. You might have on-site greenhouse gas emissions. And on-site greenhouse gas emissions is a little bit um, a little bit easier. I think it's it's we'd like to see that set at zero in in most cases, especially in places with a temperate climate like California. Um, and but there's still the question of when when is that realistically achievable? Um, and uh, so that's a process that requires some technical analysis, and that's where some of the resources are required to set those final performance standards. Once you've set the final performance standards, and everything else sort of happens automatically, all the interim standards. In terms of the question about electrification. You know, we think that building performance standards can drive electrification. And in fact, I was on a panel with Ep at EPRI, I moderated a panel, and, and the panelists all agreed, you know, the, the number one driver for electrification in large buildings right now are building performance standards, the existing ones that are out there already. Um, and, uh, but also we need to recognize that as our grid decarbonizes and as we have more intermittent power, we're gonna have the duck curve and other curves like that. And building performance standards can be part of that solution. Uh, and so we recommend coincident peak demand and, and local coincident peak demand as performance metrics, as part of a building performance standard, um, requiring that buildings uh, be part of the solution, that they be an asset on the grid, but that directly benefits the building owners because it's gonna be a lot less expensive to meet demand in the buildings than to build it all on the grid. So that's gonna mean lower rates that building owners are gonna pay because you're gonna be saving billions and billions of dollars of grid investment. Well, planning to move us into our next session uh, where we get to provide some feedback on the potential statewide policy. So um, I do wanna ask, our, well, I wanna thank our panelists so much for being with us and sharing your expertise. I just wanna ask if they are willing, would you please <clears throat> add your email address if you're willing to be contacted directly by folks that are here, put the, uh, your email address in the chat. And also, um, if you wanna share any resources that folks, mainly local governments and those that work with them can use as they start to dive into this for themselves, please post that in the chat as well. We'll try to share that afterwards. All right, with that, I'm gonna hand this back over to Mark. All right. Well, for the next part of the session, as we close out um, coming up on two hours and just appreciate everybody that's stuck with us. We still have over a hundred people, which is, which is great. Um, and just, you know, plug to uh, join LGSCC if, if you haven't, um, I'm sure we'll announce that at the end too. And we also have uh, membership pathways for industry partners that are not local governments or, or nonprofits. But for, for this part of the session, We'll be using something called Jamboard. We're really trying to get feedback. You know, as Senator Becker mentioned, um, they're really trying to um, tune up the legislation that, um, you know, could be coming in the, in the next le legislative session. Um, and being that local governments are, you know, primarily responsible um, for, for local policy and um, a lot of times falls on the shoulders for local enforcement. Uh, we, we need this group's feedback. Um, and so the Jamboard's an interactive tool. Um, you could put a sticky note. I think Serena or Gabby will demonstrate it, but you just click that little button there and add some text, it drops on there. And then you can modify it and, and put it wherever you want. And we have about three questions that we wanna ask. Um, you know, we might prop up a, an other board if, if needed, but we wanna focus on these three topic areas and we'll pass along this feedback. Um, and so the three questions that we have are, would a building performance standards or how would a, uh, BEPS help you achieve your climate action plan? There's a big connection between climate action planning um, and, and the building stock and what can we do about it? So as we think about if you don't have a climate action plan, would this fit in it? And if you do, how could you leverage this to um, get you to that uh, you know, last piece of implementing your climate action plan, which a lot of us are in. Um, the next question is, in the model scenario, so we have the model um, template ordinance from IMT, which is a great resource, a great starting point. Um, you know, what support can the state provide to local governments to adopt and implement building performance standards? So that's something that um, Cliff has mentioned in the past, but we wanna dig in a little bit more to that. Um, a lot of local governments are very eager to do that. Uh, IMT has a long-standing model going back to this thing called the, uh, the City Energy Project, which Los Angeles participated in, I think San Francisco as well. 
Um, and so, you know, what else could the state do? I know that Cliff, you advocated for, uh, you know, direct funding, and we've always done that. The Energy Commission did that in the past uh, with the local government challenge uh, using cap and trade funds. Um, and then the last question is, how would you recommend that the state and localities work together? Um, and this is something that's come across Barbara's plate is to how do they work together to support owners? Um, and then the twist on this question for the jam board is um, how would that support disadvantaged communities and people that need the support in complying with the BAP so that the onus is not on them so that there's more of a, a carrot for low income or disadvantaged communities as opposed to sticks. Um, so with that, I believe that we're going to chat if we haven't. I know there's still questions coming in, so it might've been buried, but we wanna get some feedback here. And Serena or Gabby, would we be chatting that? Um, again, we'll have about 15 minutes uh, for this feedback session. And so we can uh, leave this slide up so that you can see the questions. And then if you go click the link, um, that Gabby just posted, we can start dumping our, our stuff in there. And then maybe if people want uh, to actually put another category, maybe we can just quickly prop up uh, an uh, other board because people are just, I've never seen this many questions um, in a long time in a uh, <laughs> session. So I would imagine people do have some, some uh, additional feedback. So let's get into it. And then as people get in there, I don't know if any other panelists have any um, other prompts or any um, thoughts that you might not have gotten out during the Q&A or that have come to mind since um, you gave your initial presentation. So that can just be some background commentary. Um, I would just love to hear people's thoughts about things that we can do to advance equity in the states. Um, we know that that's, there's a huge affordability challenge, housing affordability, and there's you know, the legacy of, of systemic racism. What are resources that could be provided in the context of building performance standards to move things in the right direction? Right, and as we go through that, Angie, I know that um, CivicWell has hosted um, some discussions on, um, you know, all the good things in the governor's budget. And I don't know if um, there's also ideas there that people might want to drop in other, or if you have insights, Angie, in connecting the dots between all this state funding focused on uh, climate action and how it could dovetail with uh, local ordinances or supporting building owners if they have to comply with an ordinance. Um, you know, if the legislation eventually gets to the point where it's enacted. Yeah, I'm thinking about that too, um, how some of these new investments can really be made to, to support what the what locals would need. And it sounds like, you know, it's gonna be some form of a planning grant and the planning grants that's available right now is, you know, the Regional Climate Collaborative. Um, it wasn't really intended specifically for this purpose, but I feel like maybe something like this could be rolled into some of these larger efforts, um, you know, even SERP, even TCC, thinking about others um, where it really allows for planning um, and code development. So let me give that some more thought. And just looking at the Jamboard, I see people starting to put things in there, um, you know, highlighting in Santa Monica, which is, a, you know, a good example of I mean, I think they had the first uh, climate action plan that was recognized by the UN as a, a model climate action plan. And, you know, fast forward to today. And so there's, um, there's a measure in that climate action plan, which looks pretty interesting um, about reducing fossil gas. I, I like that term. Um, there's some information about Albany. There's, um, you know, some challenges to the decarbonizing the building stock. Um, and I think we've heard that for, for a long time is that, you know, the building code, while it's most commonly applied to new buildings, we all know it's, you know, applied to existing buildings too. Um, but the building performance standard would be 
I guess, ubiquitous and it would apply to all existing buildings um, and not just kind of be in that, that rut of only capturing uh, folks that are going to the permit counter if they do get a permit um, to do things. So it really widens the net in terms of what can be done there. Um, let me tab over to the next to the next one. Um, you know, in the model scenario, what support should the state give? Um, and I know that we do have some industry partners looking at the uh, looking at the attendee list here. So um, authorized third party verifiers and auditors. So that's a really good model. I know San Francisco and a lot of other jurisdictions, Berkeley, um, have varying degrees of either training and certification, like LA does like Los Angeles does, um, or there's a, you know, some qualifications that come with being a practitioner that helps you navigate the process and, and compile the audit information. Um, you know, we've seen the state of Washington do some really interesting stuff. And then I think it was Bellevue um, that came in with some support, a support program that used their own funds to actually help fast track um, the application process for the pot of funds that the state had, had uh, released. And so that was a really good model. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to chime in or, or verbally highlight anything else that they put on the board. So if, if you want to come off mute, feel free to do that and highlight anything that we haven't captured. Um, and feel free to talk over me. And otherwise, I'll just kind of keep uh, highlighting some things on the Jamboard. Um, but similar to ACES for REACH code. So I don't know if that's the um, energy code ACE or if that's another acronym that's not coming to mind. So I don't know if anybody has input on uh, providing resources for existing building decarbonization, similar to the ACES for REACH code. I don't know if anybody wants to explain that. Um, and then also another support thing is tariff on bill financing. Um, you know, just a big thumbs up if you're following the regulatory stuff. Um, our, our great regulatory consultant in, in partnership with uh, Santa Barbara and, and Alalia, to give you a shout out, um, have some information that they've put in a, a regulatory filing about tariff on bill financing for decarbonization tariff. And we also heard that from Becker about some legislation around tariff on bill financing. Um, pretty interesting stuff there. And then in terms of the last one here, and I see we actually have uh, a couple more slides on, on the Jamboard, but we, you know, what do you recommend the state and localities do to work together? Um, State-backed low interest financing. Um, so as you know, LGSCC is getting involved in the uh, financing proceeding. Uh, it has a fancier name than that, but we'll just call it the financing proceeding to really see how we can de-silo funding. So I think that's good that when we see the, the CPUC getting involved in financing, how does that carry over to other things that might, you know, be a part of other uh, state agencies activities? So can we help set up financing through one commission, but also launch a program for BEPS through another commission? So that's a really good, good insight there. Um, incentives, yes, that sounds like a, always a good thing on bill financing. Um, people also mentioned outreach. Right, it's very difficult to even get a comprehensive list of all the buildings in the state. Um, and so, and then also um, in language support. So I think that's also important too. One-on-one um, -on -one outreach. Um, in a state like California, that's the size of most countries, one-on-one uh, -on -one outreach is really difficult, but maybe at the local level, um, that's a really good, good model. I think the city of Brisbane saw almost a 90% compliance rate for their first round of uh, disclosure. And um, that's a really good model. I think Denver, or was it Boulder, had a really good engagement rate too um, with compliance for their benchmarking ordinance. Uh, additional feedback, I don't see anything there. So um, we'll skip that. But again, feel free to raise your hand or do anything that you can to, uh, to verbalize stuff as we have uh, our last few minutes together. So for now, I'll go back on mute for a second and see if Angie, if you want to have any other questions prompted or if the participant or if the panelists want to give any um, additional thoughts. Okay, 
you know, I, if uh, if there's just another minute or two um, for for those panelists that are still around, and Cliff, I think you'll have some thoughts here. I think you're the one kind of collecting this input. Um, just crystal ball. I always like to ask this sort of towards the end. What what do you see happening for building performance standards across the country and specifically in California in the next few years? So, um, what do you see? What do you see happening next? Um, well, certainly we hope that the 33 jurisdictions that have, including several California jurisdictions like Sacramento and San Francisco, Los Angeles, um, San Diego, um, that are part of the, the BEPS coalition will achieve on their commitments and adopt BEPS in the next couple of years. Um, and we hope that they'll be aligned in, in best practice, thinking holistically about different um, dimensions of building performance and how buildings and grid can play nicely. And help achieve our climate commitments uh, at minimum cost. Uh, we think that this is gonna get more and more commonplace, that it's gonna interact with the SEC requirements. And so building owners are going to have to disclose their potential um, BEPS obligations, which are financially material. Uh, and that's going to drive investment in high performing buildings and companies that are doing a good job of managing performance. So we see a virtuous cycle of reward, of capital flowing to better performing buildings um, and um, you know, this becoming a business critical um, attribute for any building owner or operator. Uh, and we see it spreading, you know, California is um, going to be at the vanguard, but we see it spreading to states around the country and, and not in the next few years, but eventually, potentially you're going to have federal legislation and, and it may look something like cafe standards, recognizing leaders like California and, and not preempting them, but building on it and helping others to follow their lead. All right, well, a lot happening. Um, the next couple of years sounds like at the state and federal level. Um, Senator Becker is certainly working on potentially introducing a bill. So thank you all for pro providing this feedback. I know they want to use it in crafting legislation that will really work for folks on the ground. Um, so we're going to move into uh, our next slide here. I want to just say thanks again for, for Cliff being here and making sure that they're grabbing that input from you all. Um, and thanks to all of you who participated this morning uh, in this session and to our panelists for their insights on building performance standards. Just take a moment here to share some of our program opportunities before we move into what is an optional networking session. So we're going to send links in the chat for the following offerings. So um, LGSCC, that's the Local Government Sustainable Energy Coalition, uh, it serves to advance local government's leadership on clean energy and climate resilience through regulatory action, policies, and programs. And it offers membership options for local governments, nonprofits, academia, and the private sector. So if you're not already a member and you're interested in learning more about their work or signing up just for updates, um, viewing our regulatory tracker or contacting staff, you can contact, um, contact at lgsec.org and that will be in the chat. And then SEEK, that's the program I get to work on. We're a hub for energy efficiency and sustainability news, uh, information, best practices, and resources relevant to California's local government. So uh, we're excited for our annual SEEK forum, which is coming up in September in San Diego. A call for session proposals is coming up um, actually next week and will be due on May 4th. So we're really excited for folks that are here to also participate in that event. It will be in person and we're interested in what you would have to contribute to the discussion. Um, you can also stay connected with SEEK by joining our month, uh, our public monthly uh, learn calls, so our local energy resource network calls. And um, those are great. We do that once a month for about an hour. We hope you to see you there. Both programs are also on LinkedIn so you can continue to engage with us there. So again, all of those links should be um, in the chat. And finally, just a quick thank you. Um, we're gonna move into our optional networking in just a moment, but for those that need to hop off, thanks again for being with us. All of the event materials are gonna be sent to you within a week. Uh, we would love to hear your feedback also. So Gabby is going to be posting a, a survey, a post-event survey, and that can just help us improve our events. So please complete that. It just will take you a minute or two. And um, and that's all we have for you today. And now we just hope that you have an opportunity for the next 10 minutes or so just to talk in small groups. And so this is a networking opportunity. We're just hoping that you have take an opportunity to introduce yourself, have some reflections on the event. What did you learn? What opportunities or challenges do you foresee for building performance um, uh, standards this year? And what goals do you have for building performance standards within your agency? Um, 
Okay, so we're going to move into that networking. You'll see an option for breakout sessions coming up on your screen. And with that, we'll just say stay in touch. See you next time. And do be sure to connect with us on LinkedIn. And I just say thanks for all the great ideas in the chat and on the Jamboard. And we're definitely going to take them down and mind them. Uh, this could be some really good resources as we help jurisdictions around the country on building performance standards. And thank you all for this opportunity. Wonderful. Hi, everyone. Hope that went well. Um, just wanted to bring you all back super quickly just to say thank you for engaging in that and also sending our feedback form in the chat box to please provide any feedback if you see fit. Um, but yeah, thanks for spending your morning together. Mark, any, any closing thoughts? Oh, you're muted. <laughs> Oh, I was going to say, yeah, just thanks, everybody, for, for those that stuck it out until the end. I know we dramatically lost uh, critical mass. Uh, I think people are afraid of uh, the, the one on one or, you know, just have other stuff to do in their day. But I really appreciate everything. And Cliff, I see you're still on. I just really appreciate it. And we'll we'll send you all this feedback. And um, there was a question about, is there a statewide working group? I don't know, maybe something we can think about for the future. So. Really appreciate everybody's questions. This really surpassed all of our expectations. So, and and thanks Serena and Gabby for just pulling this off and coordinating it. It, it went really well. So thanks. Thanks again, everyone. We'll follow up in about a week with some resources. Have a nice rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to good to hear everything. Bye bye.